Tasmania's southwest is a wild, rugged landscape. Its sharp mountain peaks house dense rainforests, and between these are vast plains bordered by impenetrable scrub. Its very nature is inhospitable, destitute of life and unforgiving. So why would the governor of Tasmania request a 100 km track to be cut right through the middle of it? Well, to understand this, you need to first understand the governor. For this man was no ordinary governor. This man was Sir John Franklin, British Royal Navy officer and Arctic explorer. Prior to his governorship of Tasmania, or Van Diemen's Land as it was known then, Franklin had fought the French during the Battle of Trafalgar, the US in the Battle of New Orleans, and was also aboard the HMS Investigator, which circumnavigated Australia under the command of Captain Matthew Flinders. In 1819, Franklin commenced a series of explorations in the Arctic Sea, which he was engaged until 1927 when he received the honour of knighthood. The history of his voyages and discoveries in the polar regions were already on the bookshelves of the settlers when Franklin was appointed governor of Van Diemen's Land in 1837. At a time when the mechanics of the colony was not yet seized from the strict ruling of Governor Arthur, Franklin's empathetic welcome to the colony was short-lived. Sir John Franklin, along with his wife Lady Jane, spent a great deal of focus on establishing schools and churches in the state and took a deep interest in the material and intellectual advancements of the colony. Although Franklin was a very open and honest man, in fact, the first thing he did in power was to open for the first time to the public the private proceedings and debates of the local council. His political freedoms made him unpopular in those settlers who were reliant on a system that benefited only a select few. A system which was easily corruptible. After all, although in transition, Van Diemen's Land was still a penal colony. In May 1840, Sir John Franklin was told that the British government had abolished transportation in New South Wales and that in the future, all convicts would be sent to Van Diemen's Land. Franklin's first thought was to reopen the Sarah Island penal settlement in Macquarie Harbour, which had been previously closed for seven years. A road would be needed to access the island for consistent communication, as before its treacherous path via weeks of sea and entrance of Hell's Gates made it so isolated it was essentially its own colony. Leading surveyor James Calder was appointed to mark and cut the path leading from the end of the cart road at Lake Sinclair all the way to the Gordon River. He was instructed by Sir John to be as straight and level as possible to follow the lines of natural drainage, to avoid swamps and select judicious fords at the rivers. Calder recalls of his instructions. Directly, I got permission to take this track where I like, I stuck at nothing, but went straight ahead as a rhinoceros, well knowing that as no one except our old daredevil governor would ever travel it. I need be under no uneasiness whatever as to what public opinion would say of the business. In fact, the instructions for my guidance were read to me in a very liberal spirit and deviated from whenever it suited me, which was about as much as a hundred times a day, for as things turned out, it would have been madness to adhere to them. Along with seven assigned convicts, Calder had cut the track in two years. Sir John Franklin's expedition set forth from Lake St. Clair on the 2nd of April 1842. The party comprised of Sir John, Lady Jane, Lady Jane Stewart, Christina, a surgeon by the name of Joseph Milligan, James Calder, 51st foot King's Own Light Infantry, Mr. Bagot, Corporal O'Boyle, three constables, and a dramatist by the name of David Byrne who recorded the entire journey in a title published, Narrative of the Overland Journey. These, along with 17 convicts, made up the entire party. The convict's job, not only to carry the walking party supplies, but a snake fearing, no, snake hating Lady Jane across the broken country in a palanquin. It was expected this journey would occupy eight days and provision camps were set out accordingly to accommodate rest and supply food. What resulted though was an absolutely epic tale lasting almost three times the estimated time frame, 
through which many features of the Southwest were named. In 1953, six members from the Hobart Walking Club, led by Jack Thwaites, retraced roughly half the route. These events were recorded by club president Jesse Luckman in a publication in the Steps of Lady Franklin, who writes, but because our time available for the trip was limited to 12 days, we planned to begin our walk somewhat further west than the Franklins and to connect with their route about midday on the second day. The Hobart Walking Club's route started on the Frenchman's Cap track, 30 kilometers west of Lake St. Clair. It followed this down to the Loddon Plains and climbed over the pass to Lightning Plains. From here they chose a route roughly parallel to the Franklins, traversing the Deception Range to avoid the densely forested valleys of the Acheron. After dropping down and crossing the Franklin, they then passed through a hydroelectric track to the Gordon River, all in all occupying 12 days of wearisome toils. After studying both Burns and Calder's recollections of the events, I've come to the realisation that while some of these features still remain, some are misplaced and some have been simply lost to time. You see, although they thought they did, the Hobart Walking Club never found Christmas Rock, in which Calder nicknamed after his party spent Christmas Eve sleeping underneath its overhanging front and the painter's plains where Calder found artworks inside huts of the last uncaptured Aboriginals have been lost to time. Sure, we have Artist's Hill to commemorate them, but this hill has nothing to do with the historic plains which lie kilometres from it. And what about the view that Byrne attempts to describe atop of Fatigue Hill? It transcends the power of the most gifted pen, he writes. Mine is wholly incomplete to convey the faintest idea of the scene here that meets the traveller's gaze. In this series I set out to retrace the journey based on the hard evidence left behind those who were present on the expedition. I'll travel 100 kilometres through the most wild and broken landscapes this here state has to offer, all the while capturing the stunning scenery and bringing to life the stories of those we've almost forgotten. I'm Rob Parsons and this is In the Footsteps of the Franklins. Well, this is it. I'm at Lake St. Clair. Today's date is the 23rd of April, 2022. And I'm about to embark on a 100 kilometer journey to the Gordon River. Look at this morning. Let's do it. I veered off the road and onto some random button grass plain. My plan for the day was to walk southwest for approximately 15 kilometers, arriving at the Franklin's first provision camp, located at the foot of Mount King William. The camp was appropriately named The Ponds by Calder's men from the nearby pools of water which surrounded the camp. Burn recalls of the journey towards the camp. We received our adieus and good wishes from our former companions. They, returning to the haunts of social man, 
we plunge in deeper and deeper into the primeval solitudes. The main course by compass lay south by west across the prevailing stony rises and marshy plains. So it's uh, 9.37, I've done 6 k's for a total of 2 hours and 10 minutes and it's just been amazing, it's the button grass plains, every now and again I've got to go through a patch of Malaluka, but generally it's button grass plains intersected by these uh, forests of eucalyptus and more or less just stunted growth that you can kind of cruise through some magic scenes as I'm doing this um, I guess it's going to be like this for the next for the two days that I've allocated but after that things will change dramatically as I head into the rainforest um, I've, con I've thought that maybe if I do make good time and I get to the ponds which is where Franklin's party stayed on night one. If I can get there by lunchtime, I might try and do day two's leg <clears throat> up Mount Arrowsmith uh, today, this afternoon. See how we go for time, see how I'm feeling, but it's a possibility at the moment. So I'm about 500 meters off the ponds and uh, it was somewhere around here Burns wrote that Calder actually found a skeleton 
that they believe to be the remains of an escaped convict. So, if that pops up, I'll try not to crap my pants. I pulled in to uh, get the snakes out. I need them for the ascent of Mount Arrowsmith. It's going to be a pretty big descent. It's uh, 2.30. It get dark at about 5.30. So I've got three hours to do 9Ks. If not, I'll be sleeping up on the mountain somewhere. Almost immediately after starting my ascent of Mount Arrowsmith, I came across a view which I had read about. The view was obtained over some plains named by Lady Jane, Burns Plains. And Byrne writes, Having passed about a mile and a quarter over these plains, the range of King William's Mount opens up into a variety of splendid dingles, vales and peaky promontories. So Burns Plains, is these, are these plains right here, just to the east of Mount Arrowsmith, not five kilometres over that way. Officially left the Dolorite country and are now in Quartzland. Gotta go down and around and up there, around that, and then over the back. Lone Pandani. I didn't make it to Fatigue Hill, so I'm set up here on the plains. That's Fatigue Hill just up there, the little um, rocky outcrop that you can see. I was probably only about an hour off it. Like I would have been able to make it, but it would have left me no time to set up camp before it got dark, so um, and another thing is, if I had gone up there now, I probably wouldn't have had any view. So, I don't know if tomorrow will be any better. There's no guarantee on it, but it doesn't hurt for me to wait it out. It, it gives me another opportunity to, to see the actual view um, that was described as opposed to just having a big misty cloud in your face, which is all I would have got tonight. So yeah, time to settle in here. It's cozy enough. I'm gonna cook up some spag bowl and uh, have a bit of a read about what we saw today. In case you're wondering why the hell my bag's so heavy. It's um, because of these. Good morning, guys. 
I've just woken up and I've got some exciting news. So I stuck my head out uh, the tent just then. It's like quarter to six. And I thought, oh, it sounds pretty still out there. Surely there's no rain or clouds. And the whole sky is just filled with stars. And I can see um, a little bit of the first light coming up over behind Mount Arrowsmith. Which means one thing. The Grand Vista this morning is on. Actually, first got to repair the hole in my uh, pants before I do anything. As you can see here, we had a bit of a icy night last night up here on the range. But the sun's coming up. It's gonna be all worth it. Once we get up on top of that hill, Fatigue Hill, the grandest vista in the world shall be upon our eyes. First I gotta pack this thing up. It's snowing. I'm halfway through packing up, but I had to show you how awesome this looks right now. It's going to be so good to get up there. I was excited to reach the summit on this cloudless morning and compare notes with what Byrne had written on the view, reading, It transcends the power of the most gifted pen. Mine is wholly incompetent to convey the faintest idea of the scene here that meets the traveller's gaze. Its magnificent grandeur, its boundless extent, its infinite variety, its romantic loveliness, its pictorial wildness, the enchanting graces of its innumerable panoramic beauties astound and delight fresh subjects of admiration ruin the eye at every turn. Water alone is wanting to render this the most imposing scene the world could probably produce. Perhaps, even as it is, it may fearlessly challenge such competition. At one glance the eye surveys nature in endless assumption of her most attractive forms, the grand and the gay the rich and the luxuriant, the soft and the pastoral, the savage and the sublime. Oh man, look at it. I've still got to get to the top of that one. Just give me a second to catch my breath. I'm about 10 meters from going over the peak. Are you ready for this? <laughs> oh my God. There's the Frenchman's cap over there. And my path for the next week is following these valleys covered in the cloud all the way to the Frenchman's cap, down the Loddon Plains up over Calder Pass, through Lightning Plains, onto New Year Valley, down the Acheron Valley, and then up over to White Hill Plain, across that, down to the Franklin, and then over Western Plains to Eagle Creek Track. And I'm so keen for it. Look at this, this is so incredible. Next time on In the Footsteps of the Franklins. This is a friggin' nightmare. I'm trying to figure out no one has ever seen. I am just so in the thick of it. Burn described going through stringy bark, then myrtle. 
Yeah, that's gotta be it. It's cut out. Holy crap. <laughs>